CBS Sports coverage of the NCAA championship continues. Round number two in the South region at the Gaylord Entertainment Center in Nashville, Tennessee. The second seed, Cincinnati Bearcats against the seventh seeded Golden Hurricane of Tulsa. You look at the bracket, these two got here by virtue of Craig Gumbel back in New York. Here's a reminder of what you're going to see coming up next. We will send all of you to Birmingham for the start of the South Region action between Tony Hurd, Hill Harrington, Kurtz, Brandon Kurtz, the only big player they Tulsa, Cincinnati, and Seton Hall uh, and Nashville. All of those games, we will get you to the starting times of that game, and we will get you to all of the action coming up after this message and a word from your local station. Is Kenyon Martin here or not? <laughs> is that Kenyon? Kenyon Martin is here. It's a tearful beginning for him, wiping his brow before the first round game. The consensus college player of the year, serving as an inspiration to this team. He told me prior to the start of today's game that he was not worried at all about Satterfield dealing with the pressure that Tulsa will bring. He just uh, says that Cincinnati's low post has got to be more effective and aggressive when they get the ball trying to score inside the paint because this is a team that has depended on low post points all year. And I think it's going to be important that Ryan Fletcher and also Donald Little, Jermaine Tate, we'll see a little bit later in the game. But these guys have a big size advantage, though, and can do a good job if they can get the ball in good position, Tim. Shot clock at one. Rebound to Kurtz. We'll have to take a look at the offensive rebounding today, too, which will be a big factor to see if uh, Cincinnati can take advantage of that. There's Kurtz. He does have some outstanding offensive moves. Marcus Hill for three. Too strong off the back end. Run down by DeMar Johnson. Harrington gets in position to pick up the first foul of the afternoon. The Tulsa defense is just a tremendous piece when you're talking about Tony Hurd and also Eric Coley. Tony Hurd leads the attack right now. He denies all angles through the passes, and it's, you're not even being able to get the basketball back. And once that happens, Eric Coley is right in the passing lane. He is the Wax Steel's leader and a tremendous backcourt for Coach Bill Self. Well, he's rewritten the record books and a quick whistle, which is something Bill Self does not want to see. Brandon Kurtz picks up the first foul of the afternoon for the low post, and you see the concern that he has. In his third season, a cradle of coaches, Tulsa, Steve Robinson now at Florida State, and of course, Tubby Smith had a run of Sweet 16s consecutive years. Back in 95, that went over UCLA, everyone remembers. And Nolan Richardson, formerly of uh, Tulsa, before making his move to nearby Fayetteville, Arkansas. It's a tremendous play right there. And welcome to rainy Birmingham, Alabama, where four teams chase the rainbow to Indianapolis. Game one, perennial powerhouse North Carolina challenges the number one seeds from Stanford. The starting lineups, Capel, Lang, Haywood off a 28-game performance. On Friday night, Coda the veteran, Forte, rookie of the year in the ACC. Matson, Jacobson, top rookie in the Pac-10. Collins, Mosley, and McDonald for the Stanford Cardinal. Bill Ryan Fletcher picks up two fouls in less than 15 seconds. That's definitely going to hurt Cincinnati if you can't have a Ryan Fletcher in the game. But Coach Bob Huggins does have a slew of big men. You can see Jermaine Tate coming on in the game to be able to replace Ryan Fletcher. Well, he started little and he brings Tate in off the bench for Fletcher with two quick fouls. The officials have uh, I think set a pace that this will be a tightly called game. It's up to the players now to make that adjustment. Overplay by little. 24 on the 35 second shot clock as they prepare to trigger it in. I think one of the most important things also without Kenyon Martin is that Ryan Fletcher is going to be one of those players to be able to replace Kenyon in the middle and getting points and also establishing some scoring opportunities for Cincinnati. Yeah, they, they, they lose really their best catch and shoot low block player with those two early fouls. And another whistle. Offensive foul off the ball against Marcus Hill. Now, I think the officials have made a statement. This game will be called tightly. It's going to be very tight simply because he knows he's, he has great defensive teams. And these guys are going to be using their hands all over the place. Look at that. Five fouls cumulatively. We've not played two minutes. And another bump. This is a very important factor also because when the 
when the game is called very tight. I think that definitely favors Cincinnati. Yeah, I, I would agree because Bill Self does not have any help for Kurtz in the low block. Now he does have some interchangeable parts in the backcourt. Johnson on the wing, an air ball. Marcus Hill looks to push. Leaves it for Harrington for three. Long rebound to Michael. He has numbers with Tate and Satterfield. He, you can see the great talent right there also. He had some nice, easy dish off there. But he still utilizes great body control and still made that play happen. First bucket of the game. Two minutes and 25 seconds deep. Holy. Oh, the vertical leap of better than 40 inches almost aided a tip in. Golden Hurricane, 0 for 5 to open this game. You can see this is a tough defensive battle in there. It goes to Watt Steele's leader, Coley, with a 44 inch vertical exclamation point on that play. These guys play do such a great job, though, Tim, of playing the passing lanes. Every pass is contested each and every time down the court. Greatest size advantage right here. There's Little again on the offensive boards. Pete Michael gets the loose ball. Tough shot over Foley. Well defended. Hill. Wave it off. That's a player of control foul. Tremendous play. DeMar Johnson understood exactly what was happening. As Marcus Hill was coming through, watch DeMar Johnson get himself and take the contact. Coming on through. Tulsa's defense is extremely fantastic since they do play the passing lanes. As you can see, Eric Coley coming through the passing lane, taking the shot down, doing a great job. Many teams, they don't have 30 wins for nothing. These guys play the passing lanes and make it difficult that you're not even looking at the basket, Tim. You're thinking about, where do I pass it next? Just as we pointed out moments ago, and, and you think of a, a seventh seed against a second seed. Clark Kellogg made the point earlier today, and I could not agree more with Special K. Don't let the seed affect your feeling about this game. This is a seventh seed that deserved a higher seeding. And Cincinnati believes it should have been a number one. Tim, Cincinnati understands they're playing against a talented group here. On the bump inside, B.J. Grove, who just come into the game. You and I both know that with the history of uh, Cincinnati, the last three years being ousted in the second round, they're not thinking about any kind of seeding. They're coming in here to play basketball, and they happen to be playing against a tough basketball team that you know is looking for great recognition. Oh. Again, off the ball. I don't know that I've ever seen as many off the ball fouls called as early as we have in this game. For those of you expecting to see Florida, Illinois, Seton Hall, Temple will be taking you to those games a bit shortly on the road to Indianapolis here on CBS. Greg Gumbel in New York. We'll keep you updated on what happens between Stanford and the Tar Heels of North Carolina. But those of you looking for the East Region action in Winston-Salem, time to get you there for the tip between fifth seed Florida and fourth seed Illinois. Let's send you there now and join Jim Nance and Billy Packer. All right, thank you, Greg. It was a wild day Friday here at Lawrence Joel Veterans Memorial Coliseum. Two of the four games went to overtime. And two more good ones today. Florida and Illinois, the five and four seeds, matched up in our first game, followed by the number one seed in the East, Duke, taking on the Kansas Jayhawks. Jim Nance, Billy Packer, you said it just a moment ago. What a fun day of basketball this is going to be here. Well, I've been to regionals that don't have this type of quality, Jim. This is something that that is their strength, but they can't afford to give up an offensive rebound to Manson. And Manson without Haywood in there to intimidate has his first basket at six to four. And Haywood, you know, already fatigued a little bit just from the few minutes of physical play against Collins and Manson. Forte misses. Manson rebounds. Here comes McDonald for Stanford. The bigger player in Jason Capel on Jacobson, hoping to take away some of his vision and outside shooting. Good puck fake by Manson. But Capel came in from the blind side to swat it away. A 
Mike Manson. Oh, he loves the physical nature of the game. And you just can't box him out. He's so good at spinning and moving. He's just an, an animal inside. But Jason Cable may be the X factor here this afternoon. He's a guy that has to score. He had 14 points and 11 rebounds against Missouri. So he has been active of late. Mosley for three. And Stanford reclaims the lead at 7-6. to six. Five minutes into the game. Mosley on the freshman forte getting loose. Willie does a good job of setting the pick and then popping open for the open shot. Coda off the drive. Rebound Matson. Oh, he goes up and you can just read I want it on his back. Well, you look at his body. He looks like a, a defensive end. I mean, he is thick. And he's playing against a defensive end. Julius Peppers as McDonald throws it away. Peppers in for Haywood. He's 6'7", was a freshman. Brilliant star in the Carolina football team at 6, 7, and 2, 7. Post-up game, which is very... Out of the game, Carolina's big man will experience some fatigue against the, the Beef brothers of Collins and also Matson, who also goes out of the game. Jason Collins, the twin brother of Jaron Collins, comes in for Stanford. So both Collins twins on the floor. Matson given a breather. And Haywood in for Peppers. No Peppers stays. And the turnover. Mosley from Las Cruces, New Mexico. This is Jaron Collins and his twin brother Jason. A way to pick him out. He has uh, the two knee pads and the longer hair. And a whistle against North Carolina. Julius Pepper with his 270 pounds is a player that uh, that can similar records both from major conferences both young and loaded they go far beyond the starting five Billy absolutely so foul trouble should not be a factor in this game ball handling definitely will be Lon Kruger's third trip to the tournament in four years at Illinois they have not in the other two appearances gotten past the second round losing in 1997 to Chattanooga 98 to Maryland of course this is the third different team he has taken to the NCAA tournament real testimony to his ability to put together programs Kansas State Florida and Illinois and the Illini has it first decked out in white today Corey Bradford. Bradford takes Dupay down inside, figuring he has an advantage with his ability to shoot over Dupay. So all the way, but there Haslam was on the baseline. Illinois ball. You mentioned Bradford playing with a broken nose, and he uh, has struggled here. It's going back to the Big Ten tournament. His shot is off. You're right about that, Jim. Here's Cook, who did not have a good game on Friday. Matter of fact, got very few playing minutes. Griffin did most of the playing in the inside post. Brian Cook played only 13 minutes in that game against Penn. And McLean out on Miller. This should be interesting. McLean loves to go ahead and have that tough assignment. Rebound, Lucas Johnson. Big Ten versus SEC. The Big Ten having a good tournament. Michigan State, Purdue, and Wisconsin already advancing to the Sweet 16 with wins yesterday. Johnson coming off a nice ball game. Williams, not this time. Miller pulls it down. Nobody there to rebound. A charge away from the ball. Johnson does a good job on right. Normally early in the ball game, officials will let that go and tell the guys, let's play the game. That one called quickly. And here's the full court press by Florida. This is a key to the game right now. Williams gets the inbound pass and turns the ball over. Not called. Seldom do see that call. Uh, that time he really used that as an advantage, Jim. Otherwise, he'd have had a walk. Sergio McLean, Lucas Johnson, they work it around the perimeter. Bradford dumps it into McLean. He's got Miller on his back. Needs some help. Here comes the double. The pass should have been to Williams. Last touch by Hamilton. Illinois 12 seconds on the shot clock. Both teams a little tight, not able to get anything going here. Really match up well, don't they, size-wise? There's the near steal. Five on the shot clock. Williams has missed his first two after coming off 21 against Penn, a career high. 
Williams have been playing very well of late against Penn State. He was 16 and 6. 11 against Michigan State in the loss. And as you say, Jim, 21 points, three assists. He was six for nine in that game against Penn. So far, though, 0 for two. No score in this game. Almost two minutes elapsed. Florida needs to get that ball to Miller, I think, to go ahead and see what McLean can do with it. Toupay goes to Miller high. Williams on him. Switch now with Miller on him. Miller and Williams. Toupay, six on the shot clock. Goes inside, pass three. Illini members, but misfires on the shot. Up ahead, Bradford has some room, loses control of it, up Haslam. That's twice now Dupay has been able to make a block. The first one, he stripped Bradford down low. Dupay got caught under the basket, so Corey Bradford did the right thing. He released and thought he had an easy two. Hook the center from the outside. Bad shot selection so far for Illinois. Nobody underneath the basket. Right out to Miller. He Loves steps the drive. In. Same shot he beat Butler with. Comes down with the rebound. Kicks it back out. Just good save by Hamilton. Barely before it crossed midcourt. Well, we're three minutes down and nobody has a point. Both teams playing very tight. Hamilton, he did not even attempt a shot in the game against Butler, and he misfires on that attempt. Johnson's third rebound. No place to go. Charge. Now there's where Williams, the transition from a two guard to a point guard, has got to understand that he's got to stop at the foul line. He had the numbers, but he takes it three dribbles too many. Haslam standing in there to draw the charge. But Jim, he gave that up. He telegraphed his drive from about 20 feet out. These teams that combined 0 for 10 from the field. <laughs> Illinois ball, last touch by Hamilton. I'm looking for if you're Florida I think the guys got to come into the ball game right now as weeks to give them some scoring Hamilton stays on the floor they get Harvey in the game who's, who's a rebounder weeks has been their best scorer in postseason Bradford over to pay Miller with the rebound Bradford looking at Dupay didn't see Haslam coming Miller to the corner. Dupe weaving in again. He'll go back out. Top of the key. Dupe. We finally have some points. A three pointer. Dupe is short, but he's got unlimited range from the outside. Nice fadeaway move on his part. Illinois picking up full court. Break it easily on the double team. Johnson. He stops at the free throw line. Hook is rejected by Miller. Jim, that is the third rejection of what could have been baskets for Illinois. Good job right here. Cook normally an excellent finisher, but look at Miller. Really showing his versatility as a player. Florida playing a little zone in the out-of-bounds situation. Bradford three again. One for at least one for every game in his career. How about that, Jim? He's been trying to post up Dupay, having a size advantage the entire game. Then he finally steps out to his natural area offensively and buries the three. Good reverse by Harvey on Johnson. Didn't work. Not going to play Harvey out there. Harvey from the free throw line. Back of the rim. Blues. And Illinois, after finally hitting a shot, looking for two straight. Johnson, no. Oh, wow, Williams. That's quick. Well, Williams was loafing on the play. Harvey beat him to it. Harvey puts it up. Followed up by Hamilton and a whistle. Over the bat. Yep. Going against Florida. And there was a case where Williams was standing just watching the ball. Harvey beat him to the spot. A pair of threes, one on each side. That's all we have at the first break. Before you. Jacobson. Joe Bikini. Jacobson way out. That's a pro range jumper. Madsen gets a hand on it and it's out of bounds uh, to Stanford. Well, there's an example of some of the players, the two Collins twins, Jacobson from Glendora, Mark Madsen from Danville. Those are all players that uh, normally would stay in that Southern California environment, but he's gone in there and tightened his pit. First points for Jason Collins, and Stanford has a 14 to 9 lead. And so far, Mark Madsen has been unable to block him out. He's been able to get some offensive boards. Haywood inside for North Carolina. 
That's what they need for him to be aggressive offensively. Well, he does such a good job of sealing his man, and that's a tough angle pass over the top, but with his height, and he never brings it down. He keeps it up. That's to his advantage. And Collins left alone at the free throw line. Madsen sneaks in for the rebound. No whistle, and back out it comes. Madsen and Haywood know each other well. They were team members in the World University Games in Spain uh, this past summer, so they worked out against each other, like each other. Right now that responsibility is leaning on Chris Lang as a player that is unable to. Oh keep my! Out. Capel had a shot at uh, grabbing that ball and giving it to his teammate. Didn't need the hurry. It goes out of bounds to Stanford. There's the battle. There's Collins. Look at the seal. And over the top, never brings it down straight up before Madsen can get there. In the paint, each team with uh, six points. But look at Stanford, 13 rebounds already. A lot of those second chances offensively. Jacobson takes it inside, can't connect. Coda goes the other way for North Carolina, trailing 14 to 11. Knocked away, and Madsen picks up the loose ball. It appeared to be Joe Bikini who got a hand on it. Lakota's good at penetrating, but you can't dribble right into the teeth of the defense, particularly against the Stanford defense. They're very stingy inside. Jacobson again from long distance. Long toss down to Forte and a cross body block by Joe McKinney. I'm Greg Gumbel in New York. We'll keep you updated on the action between Stanford and North Carolina. But those of you headed east to Buffalo to keep track of what's going on between Seton Hall and Temple, they're getting set for the tip-off. Let's take you there now. Ian Eagle and Jim Spinarco. All right, Greg, thank you very much. HSBC Arena is the site for the final game of the day here in Buffalo. Tenth seed at Seton Hall taking on the number two seed, the Temple Owls. Earlier today, Oklahoma State getting the victory over Pepperdine to advance on to the Sweet 16. They will meet the survivor of this matchup between the Pirates and the Owls. Hi, everybody. Ian Eagle along with Jim Spinarco. And you can think about some of the great finishes in NCAA tournament history. And we saw one of them two days ago with Shaheen Holloway evoking the memory of Danny Ainge and Ty Zedney. Seton Hall getting the win in overtime to advance on. And Shaheen Holloway he knew the situation. He had eight seconds left in his senior year in his career at Seton Hall. Took the basketball. Watch what he did. He went down the floor. Oregon did not pick him up. Penetrated. Puts the ball off the glass. Keeps his senior year alive. Shaheen Holloway is the point guard for the Seton Hall Pirates. The point guard for Temple is Pepe Sanchez. And John Cheney told us the Atlantic 10 player of the year is just a throwback, flat out. A throwback and also a coach on the floor and a little different style than Holloway because what Sanchez will do and what he did against Lafayette is just pick you apart. 15 assists the other night. Very infrequently will he take shots, but I would venture a guess that Seton Hall might try to force him to shoot the ball a little bit. Tommy Amaker gets a win in his NCAA tournament debut as a head coach. Of course, he's been there as an assistant and as a player. Seton Hall starting lineup up front, Greg Morton, Samuel Dellenbear, and the three-guard set of Darius Lane, Remus Kaukatis, and Shaheen Holloway. For the Temple Owls, the number two seed in the East, and they are big, Lamont Barnes and Kevin Lyde along with Karcher on the front line. Quincy Wadley and Sanchez are in the backcourt. Sanchez coming off a career-high 15-assist performance. John Cheney, 18th season as the head coach at Temple. They have been to the NCAA tournament 16 of the past 17 years, including a streak of 11 in a row. And, and this really is an interesting game as you take a look at the officials for today. Tony Green, Mark Whitehead, and Ed Etzel. A situation where you have the beginning of this game is so important. Temple leads the series 5-3. to three. Their last meeting, February 10th, 1972, where Temple won 71-58. to 58. But it's so important. You have these cliches at the starts of basketball games. Sanchez and how he directs the traffic at the other end of this basketball game, Seton Hall, and how well Darius Lane and Remus caught Canis hit the outside shot especially early only about 90 miles separate these two schools but how they got to the second round 
Worlds apart. Temple with a 73 to 47 blowout win over Lafayette. The game never in question. And Seton Hall needed heroics not only from Holloway in overtime, but from Remus Caucanus in regulation. A little drift through the lane with Caucanus, but you know, it's interesting. Those two guys are seniors. They rely on one another. They deflect all the attention back and forth. They don't want to take it upon themselves except to hit big shots. It's a nice story for Seton Hall, especially with Holloway and Caucanus. Talk about the strength up front for Temple. D'Alembert focusing on him. He has to stay out of foul trouble. There's no question about it. The first game, he stayed on the floor a long enough to keep Tommy Amaker happy. It's so important for him not to pick up quick, needless fouls down deep in particular. Temple controls the tap. The winner moves on to Syracuse in the East Regional. Here comes the man-to-man -man defense trying to keep Sanchez busy, too. Here's Lott using his body on the skinnier Dellen there. Knocked around. And it's going the other way. A loose ball foul called. Kevin Lye trying to follow his own miss. A good start for Down there just then because he had a couple of ball fakes thrown right in his face. He didn't budge. It's one of the interesting things about him as a young player. More times than not, you get a young player, you give him a ball fake or a head fake, and he's off the floor. He's pretty good at staying down. He's listed at 6'11. He's more like 7'1, 7'2. And the wingspan. Forget about it. First possession for Seton Hall. Cortinas couldn't handle the pass, and here comes Sanchez off the double team. Using the pressure, and Holloway is called on a foul. We've talked about D'Alembert staying on the floor. Holloway must stay away from foul situations. Here you see the jump in, but there's absolutely no way he's going to get this basketball coming from behind. He may appear to have the ball in that shot, but the official standing behind him. He can't see that. So one team foul apiece. Lyde picks up one, and Holloway for Seton Hall. Ball's a pretty good pressure team on the perimeter also. Here's Lodd with a ball fake. They go right at Dellenbear. Karcher lines it up for three and hits. Mark Karcher has really developed that long-range ability. Took 16 long-range shots in the first round. Gaukanis on a kick out for Lane, who struggled from beyond the three-point line in the first round. As it came out of bounds off of Wadley. If Karcher can get these shots to go down, you see him stride right into the picture there. And by striding into his shot, you get more confident and confidence as a shooter. Kalkanis will toss it in. 21 seconds left on the timer. Just over a minute gone by here in the first half. Okay. Seton Hall, the 10 seed. Temple, the 2 seed. The Atlantic 10 champions. And here's a surprise. They start with a matchup. Zone, huh? Everything you know about Temple. This is their defense. They play it well. They come to the perimeter. John Cheney's signature. Caucanus for the tie. Short. And Sanchez has the rebound. Got a good look. And it's a controlled offense. Wadley a three. He connects. You talk about balance on your jump shot. He gathered himself and some confidence there also. Two long-range bombs already. Six-nothing out. There's Lane on a bounce for Dellender. Cross court, Holloway. Spin move around Wadley. Inside, he forced the pass and a turnover. Lodd has it taken away by Holloway. And a scrum for the ball. Sanchez feeds Wadley. Lines it up. Can't hit the three, and Kalkanis tracks down the loose ball. A basketball play just done by Sanchez. Kalkanis wants to go end to end. The runner, offensive foul. So there's a situation where the nerves are taking over just a little bit, not the mind, because Barnes was planted, oh, for about three seconds ago for John Cheney's defense, and Caucanus kept dribbling and dribbling from half court and just ran somebody over. So far for the Pirates, 0 for 1 shooting, three turns. Here's Wadley now handling the ball. Sanchez being watched by Holloway. This is where Holloway has to be careful. Pressure, but don't reach, and don't pick up a needless foul. He has one already. Karcher, a three. Oh. If they hit those shots, they are a totally different team. Karcher. Nine nothing outs. Here's Lane, trying to work on Wadley. Temple off to the quick start. They're going to need to get a little bit of a penetration type move against this zone when it rotates. Crossover by Holloway. Lane a three. He's got it. Oh, and by the way, Darius Lane will shoot and will make a lot of threes if he gets in some rhythm. First shot is so important for him. When he knocks it down, he's a different player. 
14 points in the first round victory, but five of 18 shooting for Lane. You'll notice the pressure out on Carter. If you put, bury a few, you have to come out Lane, trying to find them quicker. Sanchez feeding the post and Kevin Law. See, I think those Seton Hall likes the post defense with Dallin Bear. Sanchez won't shoot off him. So why is Holloway leaving his feet? Pepe Sanchez <laughs> at Dallin Bear nearly oh, took it out of midair and grabbed it. It's goaltending. And an easy one for the official Sanchez floating. It looks impressive, but you got to stay away because that ball looked like it may have been missing, actually. 11-3, Temple. Here's Holloway trying to direct traffic, calling out a play. Seton Hall wants to get some cuts going through the lane. Came off the foot of Sanchez and a steal, averaging nearly three and a half. Lead pass and Wadley on the finish. Temple. They come out of the gates in a hurry and they lead the hall 13 to 3. Early first half. Burr from Independence Community College out of Cincinnati, Ohio, doing it to the team that he had hoped to play for. Terrific kid. He said that uh, he had his dream dinner with three people any time in history. It would be Abraham Lincoln, John Wooden, and Cervantes. Uh, there are the parents who said one thing we always had. We made sure plenty of books in the home. Spencer Tillman talked with them on Friday night. Basketball was okay, but doing a lot of reading. Can you think about it? sitting down? Mark Madsen with the Wizard of Westwood, Abraham, Honest Abe, and uh, the Man of La Mancha. That, <laughs> that just shows you where he is. That huh? just shows you the, the depth. Of Manson, not as an athlete, but as a human being. He's just a delightful person to be around. He's always coming out before the game starts and chatting, and just a delightful young man. Six minutes to go in this first half, a seven point lead for Stanford, and a turnover was saved by Collins. McDonald breaks out but doesn't have the numbers. Mosley will take the three anyway. Rimmed out. And Jacobson with another offensive rebound, Stanford. That's a key to this first half, no question. And Carolina did such a good job against Missouri. They out rebound Missouri with a big margin. So collectively, they're going to have to do it against Stanford because Stanford guards do a good job of rebounding as well. McDonald fails on the three-point attempt. Haywood with the rebound. Carolina's got to find some other offense. They cannot milk Brendan Haywood to death. They got to find Coda Forte. Not active, set some picks. There's Capel. He's a guy that's also capable of scoring. Been able to hit on the drive, and Jaron Collins with the rebound. McDonald surveying the court as he brings it in. Collins from 17, short. Oh, look at the hands of Mosley. It appeared that ball was getting away, and he still gets it. Terrific facility, <laughs> well, Mosley. He's got great hands and the ability to tip the ball to yourself and get off the floor quickly is uh, is a key to Mosley's rebounding ability. He's not a tall guy, but he has a knack for where that ball is. Less than five minutes left in this first half. Carolina with the ball down by seven to Stanford. Number eight seed, North Carolina, the top seed here in the South, Stanford University. Forte can't get inside that tough defense. Peppers back in the game. The left-hander not there. Haywood tips. Haywood trying to get the rim. Peppers, and he scores. Julius Peppers pounding the boards has his third point of the game. Well, one thing about Peppers, he's not going to be moved out of the way. And as much beef as the Stanford team has, it's good to have him in there to kind of act as a fire hydrant. He's not going anywhere, and he's strong with both hands. Madsen up on top. Collins underneath. And Madsen just deflected by Peppers. Out of bounds to Stanford. Under four to go. Timeout in Birmingham. I think uh, Bradford kind of smiled because he knew he kind of faked one out on the referee there. Nice move by McLean again, slowing things down. Turn this into a half-court game. I'd say that favors Illinois with Bradford's outside shooting. They need to get Cook started, though, Jim. He hasn't done anything in the NCAA tournament so far. Uh, here he goes. Cook gives it up. McLean, three-point shot. Wow. Yes, an assist on the last trip, this time a three. 
First lead for the Illini. Haslam with a two-point basket cuts the lead to one. That breaks a ten-point run by the Illini. This, this, there's Miller on the contact, cheap one. There's a case also, McLean goes down. They really should have fouled on that play, Haslam, Jim, and not let him have that easy basket. Look at this. Dupay could not knock Sergio down if he caught him uh, half asleep. Complete fake there. Twice we have had that kind of play. Charge away from the ball. Double team McLean. Look at him bust through the double team. Is he well schooled or not? By the way, big time high school coach, four state championships at Peoria Manual High School. Illinois playing the game much more to their liking now than what they did the first a few minutes of this one. Harrington bangs home a three. Freshman from Bartlett, Illinois, another coach's son. His dad, Jim, the coach at Elgin High School. We will have some coaches in the audience in the second game as well that are here to see their sons. Hobison, yep. Heinrich of Kansas, both coaches' sons out of Iowa. 20 and 19, 20 hour driving trip to come down here to this game. The foul is on number 34, Brian Cook called for that one, his first. And you're right, Billy, a, a tough tournament start for the freshman who was co freshman of the year in the Big Ten with Michigan's Lavelle Blanchard. Oh, nice switch. Nelson gives it up. Dupe, he's already hit one. Got and now second. He's got unlimited range, and you notice, Jim, he has a slight, he turns his back backwards when he shoots his jumper, so it's very difficult for a bigger man to get to him. It's kind of a fadeaway jumper. Johnson, oh, beautiful. Look, that was easy. Johnson doing a pretty good job distributing the ball. And you notice where he stopped there? Oh, he's right just inside the free throw exactly. line. Exactly. He created the angle by stopping earlier. Here you have a forward showing guards how to do it. Florida can get shots if Illinois is going to go behind that high screen. They can get jumpers right at the top of the key. McLean fights over it. Another yeah. illegal yep. screen. Going the other way again. Haslam. Well, there's the difference. McLean came over the top of the screen, took away the jump shot. Haslam used his wide body to pick up the, the uh, foul. Grapoglia off the bench, six points, pair of rebounds. And the Illini leads by three. Uh, they think that they're still playing. He's going to shoot the foul instead of going for the timeout. To put McLean on the line, one of only two players on the Illinois squad with NCAA experience before this year. Victor Chukadebe, the other, they played in the 98 tournament. And one of three Mr. Ba basketballs of Indiana. How many, in the next 15 years, how many Mr. Basketballs of Indiana do you think, are, I mean, of Illinois, do you think are going to go to the Illinois? Bigger Lon Kruger probably be pretty good at recruiting them. He might get a pretty good <laughs> run going. I like his odds. McLean hits the front end of the one and one. You get a figure. Pat Kennedy's going to do a pretty good job in Chicago, and Lon probably going to get a few Mr. Basketballs himself. So he's got McLean, former Mr. Basketball, got Frank Williams, Williams and Marcus. And, and Cook. They cut. Brian Cook. Yep. So he hits both. And the Illini has its largest lead, five point advantage. Offensive clout off the bench. Mosley Mendez, you would think would be the Collins twins and Manson, but so far on the boards for Stanford has been the guard play. Something Carolina has to correct. The defense by Madsen as he fronts Haywood. Mendez moves to the left corner. He has seven and Mosley with ten. Inside. Matson with a fake. Blocked by Peppers. That's twice he's blocked Matson. Forte. Jacobson and Forte, the two first year players matched defensively. Forte scores. Joseph Forte, the freshman from Greenbelt, Maryland, 6'4 over Jacobson. Jacobson is 6'6. 
I really believe that they're going to have to let Forte handle the basketball a little bit from the top. He can get inside the defense and cause it to collapse as well. Not a, as good a passer as Coda, but definitely can break down the defense. Inside and the pass by Mendez off the fingertips of Matson, and a turnover, the sixth by Stanford. 1.14 to go in the half. And even though Chris Lang is taller and bigger than Peppers, Peppers is stronger, and he has the capability of pushing Lang, excuse me, pushing Matson out just a little bit farther than he'd like to catch the basketball. Coda looks over at head coach Bill Guthridge, who shouts out the play. Matson battling inside with Haywood, getting help from Collins defensively. Capel from long range hits another three, and it's 27 25, Stanford. And there's your guy. Now, if Carolina is going to stay close and be successful, I honestly believe that Capels is the guy that's going to have to step up. He's been very active in slowing Jacobson down. Jacobson partially blocked by Peppers. That's his third. And a chance to tie or take the lead, North Carolina. 31 seconds left. They want to get a good shot going into the locker room. They've done a good job of keeping this game close. Only two points down. Jacobson not really a factor. However, Mosley and Mendez have been. A three second difference in the clocks. Ten now on the shot clock. Coda with five. Peppers with four. He scores and he's fouled. North Carolina rallies here late in the first half to tie the game and that's the third foul on Jaron Collins and that's a big foul you want to watch the pick and the roll peppers with the left hand no one is going to come between him and that big broad shoulder chest of his good utilization of the left hand going to the basket the three-point pay play for Julius Peppers and North Carolina leads 28 27 Stanford calls time they got six seconds and change to try to reclaim it Conclusion of every NCAA tournament game will select the Chevrolet most valuable players of the game to date Chevrolet has contributed over eight million dollars to the scholarship funds of America's colleges and universities. There's the man who has given Bill Guthridge big minutes and he's a big man Julius Peppers averaging four a game has led this comeback 8 0 run David Mosley with 10 is the top scorer for Stanford and the Cardinal was 6.3 seconds to get off a shot. McDonald will hurry it into the offensive end. And it's stolen by, yes sir, Peppers, and he'll get a shot away. North Carolina with eight unanswered points in the final two and a half minutes of this first half overcomes an eight-point Stanford lead. And the North Carolina Tar Heels lead at the intermission 28 27 CBS exclusive coverage of the NCAA basketball championship will continue after this message and a word from your local station. Reed, the freshman, number 14, pressed into duty because of the foul difficulty. Charlie Davis, another freshman from Prairie, Texas, in the game. I dare say Bull Self didn't think coming into this game he'd have to play them this soon. With the clock winding down, Johnson a rejection. Tremendous play right there by DeMar Johnson, showing the great size advantage over Antonio Reed as he went to the bucket. This is very judicious use of the bench by Bill Self because you know he's trying to save his guys in foul trouble for the stretch run. This is damage control for him right now. And he has to give them a blow also. These guys have to come in and continue to do a good job. Swanson dumps it to Coley. Great pass inside, but again, Cincinnati's tall towers knock it away. Ted Valentine got a little help that time from Joe DeMaio, and it goes the other way. This is a good scramble for the ball here. Eric Coley going after the ball. He hit it last, and it went off Ted Robinson's, it went off Ted Valentine's leg. 
Watch Cincinnati chasing the guards here. This is an important factor right now, too. They're getting the ball, negating them from making the next pass. Anytime you have the basketball out here, watch them go to the basket, utilizing that size and taking it away from them. That's exactly where Cincinnati has the advantage, though, being able to play tall, play big, but play with talented players. Michael in on the low block. Not there, pulled down by Coley. Now, what we're seeing this Cincinnati team do defensively, it's helped this 10 0 run take place, is exactly what Bob Huggins told us yesterday, Jimmy Dykes. He didn't want to do. Yeah, I mean, he felt like that it was not to his advantage to extend his defense, get his bigs away from the basket, but ironically, that's what's gotten him back into this ball game by extending that half court pressure. This is a guy that's won a lot of games, guys. Last day of the first weekend of March Madness and all kinds of madness going on. We'll take you to live action around the country. Coming right up. CBS Sports presents Pennzoil at the half. Sponsored by Pennzoil. Specially formulated for today's stop and go driving. Stop. Go. Pennzoil. Hi, everyone. Greg Gumbel in New York, along with Clark Kellogg. Welcome to Penn's Oil at the half. We are at halftime of the game between North Carolina and Stanford, and it's a 28-27 Tar Heel lead. You surprised? Not really, because North Carolina got some timely three-point shooting. Shooting Brendan Haywood's doing a nice job inside. They finished the half with an 8-0 run to gain that one-point lead. That's why you're the best partner in the country. Nothing surprises you. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. In the game in Nashville between Tulsa and Cincinnati, some people may be surprised by this. The Golden Hurricane came with a seven point lead. They are under a minute and a half to play. Let's take you there live and join Tim Brando and Rolando Black. Cincinnati in the middle of a 12 1 run has closed what was a 14 point gap. Down to five. Satterfield just made a nice play to the bucket, utilizing his talent and skill and jumping over her on that play once he got to the paint. Those are the type of plays that he can make because he has more height. Satterfield with a little ball pressure of his own. Coley tries to make the interior pass and does to Shelton. Tough play on the interior as Coley makes the play to Shelton. But Shelton utilizing that body, being able to make the, make the play. Had great hands to corral that pass and then throw it up from the hip. Bill Self all smiles up by seven. This is my invention. The silverware instrument. C'est les lunettes éclairantes. You could slide them, but they don't slide by themselves. It worked. It worked. Headlight. It could change somebody's life. 24 hour sundance. That is the greatest idea I've ever came up in my whole life. A look at the South Region first round bracket. Moving on into the second round. Tulsa and Cincinnati, Miami and Ohio State to come later today. Both teams, and of course, Cincinnati and Ohio State are salivating at the idea of a meeting. They don't like one another. They haven't played in some time. There are a number of uh, reasons that only legislators in the state of Ohio can answer. <laughs> but first things first, this uh, Tulsa team, 29 and four in the regular season, coming away with their 30th victory in the first round of this NCAA tournament, believes they too deserved a higher seating than that of seven. They did lose three times to Fresno State. That probably had something to do with it. Cincinnati playing uh, with the same kind of tenacity on the defensive side that we expected from Tulsa. You, you know Cincinnati is going to be tough inside, but they have brought some perimeter pressure themselves. And they've done a good job of it, too, taking Tulsa out of moving around, moving their plays, especially when Tulsa got off to a good start in executing their plays. Shot clock at two. Michael out of bounds. Control to Tulsa. Bobby Huggins can't believe it. But even though Pete Michael missed that shot, those are good shots and good plays for Pete Michael, utilizing his skill and his talent to get close to the basket. So Cincinnati with 24 points, three seconds to play in the first half. And we'll keep track of that game for you. Meanwhile, in Buffalo, Seton Hall and Temple, just under seven minutes to play. 21-20. Owls, let's take you there. Bill Self. 
himself can't believe a foul was not called there. Coach, I think you've got a heck of a case. He got, he got slapped on the top of his head. In different feelings, I'm sure, for the coaches. Jimmy Dyke standing by with one of them now. Jimmy. Three shots for him from long range. The tide has turned a little bit. Seton Hall quiet early on in this game, and Ty Shine filling in for the injured Shaheen Holloway has really given Seton Hall a lift. Seton Hall, 7 of 10 from three-point range, and Shine, you're right, has provided the spark. Rollerson on a kick out for Wadley. We're tied up at 23. Sometimes having an injured player on your team can give you a psychological lift, and it has helped them now. A timeout. 6.08 left. First half. 23 apiece. Let's check into the Microsoft Data Bank and look at some of the major conferences, how they're faring. It has been just a sensational start for the Big Ten to, to this point. Well, Jim, you see they have five remaining, but they actually have three in. SEC has one already advancing. Big 12, two already advancing. So not only are they doing well, they're pretty solid. In the Big Ten with Michigan State, Purdue, and Wisconsin already into the Sweet 16. Illinois playing here. Ohio State also playing today. They could have five of the 16 spots. We'll turn, this, uh, turn this tournament into another Big Ten tournament. Well, we've seen one of those yeah, just last week. Again away from the ball, they call it on Cook. Well, Wisconsin, did that surprise you yesterday, Jim? Well, I, I thought your point about when you don't get to play against a Wisconsin, a Dick Bennett coach team all the time, you don't know what to expect. You're just not ready for it. I think it's very difficult. I, I thought Lute Olsen. Bill, Tulsa's Golden Hurricane in charge. We'll talk about that game and then send you some live action elsewhere. CBS Sports presents Pennzoil at the half. Sponsored by Pennzoil. Specially formulated for today's stop and go driving. Stop, go, Pennzoil. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Pennzoil at the half. Greg Gumbel along with Clark Kellogg at halftime. Tulsa leading Cincinnati 31 to 24. They're the Bearcats. Fewest points in a half prior to today was 26. Tulsa looking pretty confident. Well, they're a very good defensive team, Greg. But Cincinnati showed me something in coming back from a 16-point deficit to close to within seven. So their confidence has to be at a high level going into the second half, I think. All right, Clark. Meanwhile, Florida and Illinois are doing battle in the East region in Winston-Salem. It's a 31-31 game as they come up on three minutes to play in the first half. Let's take you there live. Jim Nance and Billy Packer are courtside. Yeah, with another steal. You must make the catch if you're going to make the pass into the interior. Karcher's been hot from the outside, and he hits another. See, just the hand out there isn't going to work on Karcher. You really have to get out and belly up a guy who's knocking it back. Mark Karcher, four for five from three-point range. He has 14 points overall. Shine off penetration. Harris catches it, but he's out of bounds. So Seton Hall and Temple just three points separate. Carter 14 for Temple as they are just under five and a half to play in the first half. Elsewhere, Florida and Illinois, it's a 33-31 lead for the Fighting Illini coming up on 250 to play in the first half. And earlier today in Buffalo, Oklahoma State's Cowboys advance with a 75-67 win over Pepperdine. Game still to come here on CBS later today. Two games out of the South, Miami, Ohio State, UConn against Tennessee, and out of the East Top Seed, Duke will take on Kansas. We'll take a time out here and then send you back to second half action in Birmingham. Thanks for joining us on Pennzoil at the Half. Pennzoil at the half has been sponsored by Pennzoil. Specially formulated for today's stop and go driving. Stop, go, Pennzoil. It's blocked by Chukadebe. Hey, this is a deep squad, isn't it? Both teams. Well, they are. both are. Yeah, they really are. In contrast to what we'll see Duke in the second game today, plays. Primarily a six-man squad, sometimes goes to seven. But Kansas has tremendous depth, too. Yep. Snaps it, corner, Lucas Johnson. Ten on the shot clock. Harrington, look at this passing. Johnson, three. Yep. Johnson 
making some funny decisions there. They still had plenty of time in the clock to get it to Bradford. Bonner wanted that ball down inside. Weeks takes it, gets it. Florida's back in front. Weeks, an excellent score. He's a great pure shooter, holds the record at Florida, 33 straight fouls, throws the ball away. That's yours, Jeff. Good catch. You want to actually get it back to him? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Two handed grab, nice fundamentals. Gonna... Live on CBS, the first rebound of Jim Nance's career, 35 33. Florida in the lead. Meanwhile, in Buffalo in the East Region, Temple and Seton Hall, the Pirates have closed the gap. Three point difference. Let's take you there now. Ryan Eagle and Jim Spinarco. Owls lead at 26 to 23, 3.52 to play in the first half. Quincy Wadley with a floater, adding to the Temple lead. It really hasn't been a Temple interior play that has been doing the damage to this point. It's been their long range shooting, especially Karcher shooting the ball. Seton Hall still trying to fight off the injury to Shaheen Holloway and just hang around here for the next three and a half minutes so they can get to the half and regroup. Holloway's been taken to a local hospital with an ankle injury. His replacement, Ty Shine, could not make that length. And Temple now with a five-point lead and the ball. 3.20 left, first half. When you get those seams against Temple, you really have to get the basketball to go down for you. Wadley gets the step on Lane, who recovers defensively. Karcher's been hot. That one too strong on a three-pointer. Well, Canis got out on him though that trip. Shine looking for Dellen Bear. Ball knocked around. Karcher gets it to Sanchez. 11 Seton Hall turnovers. Good cut by Sanchez. No return though. Karcher couldn't handle it, and this will be a breakaway for Paul Canis. He leans in for the layup. A rare mistake by Temple at the offensive end. An actual two-on-O break, which you don't see too often in basketball. That's how bad that pass was thrown. Five points for Remus Carpenis, the native Lithuanian. Has cut the Temple lead to three. With Dallin Bear back on the floor for Seton Hall at seven feet tall, it allows Seton Hall to really pressure more of the perimeter. And Carpenis will be assessed with a personal foul. 14 foul on Seton Hall. Karcher a little slow to get up. He's grabbing his left ankle, and we'll take a break. 2.25 left. Temple up by three in the first half. When Billy the Kid was the coach at Marshall, back the youngest Division I coach at the time when he was named head coach after serving five years on the Patino staff at Kentucky. Looking for one. They're going to have to shoot the ball up there. Got about six seconds differential here. Florida drops back. Looked like they're setting up a little zone here. Timeout. And there you see McLean. He just not happy with what the setup was. Over six minutes without a field goal made by the Illini. Down six. Seton Hall's three-point shooting has gotten the Pirates back into this game. Temple leads it by three, under two and a half minutes to play. South region action in Birmingham, North Carolina, with a three-point lead on top seed Stanford. Let's take you there live and join Dick Enberg and James Worthy. Friday night. North Carolina trying to stun number one seed Stanford and the Tar Heels have moved up by five 32 27 they trail by eight late in the first half an 8 0 run before the buzzer took them to the locker room in front by one and they've scored the first two baskets of this second half and the Carolina defense has dictated their offense the first half it was there's a big steal by Coda Carolina has a couple of numbers for Tate and the block but a foul on McDonald of Stanford. As I was saying, the first half, it was Capel's good defense on Jacobson. Then he hit the big threes. Now in the second half, Chris Lane has established himself inside, putting a little bit more pressure on that interior defense. But Coda, excellent pass to Forte. He's shooting two. And Coda with a big steal at the other end. You could see his senior leadership, the 6'2 veteran from Brooklyn, New York, Tilden High School and St. Thomas More School. He was one of five Carolina freshmen to be the ACC Freshman of the year and Chris Lang goes uh, slowly off the court and holding his uh, left rib cage. Well, he got hit right in the sternum area and maybe the wind left him a little bit. He's gasping. Julius Peppers, one of the. A couple of minutes gone in the second half. How likely is that up?